Thank you so much for joining us online for the message. Now, today we're kicking off a two-week series called Circle Up. And it's a series that's all about inviting others to begin a relationship with Jesus together in community. Now, one of the goals at all of our campuses is to help people find their place with us. And we found that this happens best as we move from listening, sitting side by side in rows on Sundays, and we get into conversation circles where we can engage and share experiences that we have with Jesus in our daily lives. Now, of course, the process of moving from rows to circles begins with an invitation to come experience Jesus personally. It then takes its next step when we grab a hold of opportunities to engage each other about Jesus together. Invitation and experience. That's what we're talking about for the next two weeks. Now, whether these invitations and experiences take place in a home community, at a coffee shop with men's or women's groups, or even at the church within a community group or a youth Bible study, we've found that spiritual growth happens best within the context of a community of people who love Jesus and love each other. Whenever and wherever people take an interest in anything, a community of people will form around what they're interested in. Whether it's sewing, singing, or sports, people who love something, they'll gather together to talk about it, to evaluate it, and they'll also invite others to experience it as well. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of innovative ways that we can find out about fun, exciting, or interesting things. That's basically what advertising is. Advertising is an invitation to try something. Commercials, emails, pop-ups, these are always interrupting our present experience to tell us about the next great product, innovation, or experience. But when ads arrive unwanted, interrupting something, or they promise something that seems impossible to deliver, that's when we begin to ignore or eliminate them. You've probably downloaded an ad blocker or started a live program 15 minutes late so you can skip the ads. We love excluding unwanted invitations by playing defense against them. Now, advertisers know this. They know that people are trying to work around their unsolicited invitations so they can either try to sneak them in or do their best to work only with great products. Products and experiences that are so good that they sell themselves. A product that sells itself is so good that the minute someone uses it or experiences it, they immediately begin telling other people about it. Maybe it's a delicious food or a great song, a vacation destination. The best stuff travels quickly by word of mouth. Now, some products work so well that they never have to advertise. You use them once, and then you're hooked. Even potentially hazardous products that you've never seen an ad for still fly off the shelf, even when they have a warning label on the packaging. I'm actually talking about Q-tips, people. It says right there on the box not to put them inside your ear, but it feels so good. We immediately tear open the box and just start jamming them into our ears and the ears of our children. They're so good, they don't have to advertise. They just exist, and parents pass them on from generation to generation. Now, these incredibly effective Q-tips, they've found an immovable place in our society, right next door to our brains, and they've done it through personal invitation and experience. When someone you know and trust invites you to try something, it connects with you in a way that all the clever techniques of advertising can't. The best invitation is always the personal invitation. Now, this is super important for us to keep in mind because when it comes to inviting people to meet Jesus in community with others, many people have experienced unsolicited interruptions and experiences that did not meet their expectations. People are playing defense, and this skepticism can only be overcome by experiences with Jesus that produce transformation. Today, we're going to see that Scripture demonstrates the best invitations to Jesus well, those are inv invitations to shared transformative experiences. And as we identify and invest our lives into others, we will invite them into life-changing experiences with Jesus, with us. Today's invitation story from the Bible begins with someone named John the Baptist. 
John was a public figure who began his ministry just a few months before Jesus. In fact, John was Jesus' cousin. They grew up together, but John didn't know that Jesus was going to be the savior that the ancient people were eagerly anticipating. See, their prophets had been telling them that the arrival of the Savior was near. And John himself was going to be the last of Israel's prophets. The prophets were holy men dedicated to hearing God's voice and calling people to obey God so that they could receive his blessing. And God was sending a Savior to the world because humanity has a problem. Our problem is knowing what is right, true, and good. And even when we figure it out, we then find tremendous difficulty in doing it. You see, selfishness consumes every one of us who's ever lived. This is why John called the people of Israel to turn from pursuing their selfish desires and dedicate themselves to pursuing God's desires. He was preparing them for the arrival of God's Messiah, God's chosen one. John invited them into an experience called baptism, and they would come meet him at the Jordan River and he dipped them under the water. This baptism, it was the outward sign that someone had turned from their selfish pursuits and were choosing lives of godly obedience and service. Now, these baptisms became a national craze. People were coming from all over to hear John preach and be baptized. And at these baptisms, Jesus appeared when he was 30 years old, and he asked John to baptize him. And as John baptized him, he saw a vision And John told his disciples about it here in John chapter 1, verse 32. It says this, Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. The Spirit of God convinced John that his cousin Jesus was the one to lead the world into goodness and truth. And he declared this to his disciples, the group of young people who were apprenticed to follow him, people who were apprenticed to learn his ways and then go out to spread his message. You see, in ancient times, prophets and rabbis had young apprentices, people that they poured their lives into, shaping them to become world shapers in turn. They did this in community, traveling, studying, eating, and praying together as a group. Only Sith lords had just one apprentice. It goes on to say this, right? The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. And when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. In this moment, John says something specific that his apprentices would understand. He identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now, this might seem like a puzzling title to us, but John's disciples had studied the Hebrew Scriptures. In these stories, sacrifice was always the demonstration of love. People sacrificed what they loved in order to demonstrate their love to their beloved. This is true for us today. When a fiancé buys a diamond to give to their intended, the sacrifice of money and beauty is a demonstration of love for their priceless partner. In the story of Abraham, the father of their faith, Abraham was commanded to offer a sacrifice. And without a lamb, he had to trust that God would provide one for him. And God provided one for Abraham to sacrifice. And in doing so, it was a prophecy that God's Messiah would be the sacrificial lamb that God provided to demonstrate his love for humanity. One precious person would die in the place of all of sinful humanity. John told his followers that Jesus was God's sacrificial lamb. He believed it because God revealed it through his supernatural experience with Jesus at his baptism. And John wanted them to believe it too. John believed that Jesus was the savior of the world and he was inviting them to follow him. And they took his invitation. 
Which brings up an important question, right? Do you believe that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world? That Jesus is the answer to the brokenness that we experience in our everyday lives? And that following him, living life his way, unselfishly and sacrificially, will solve the world's problems? Do you believe that? Well, if so, then you, like John, will do anything to see others follow him, even sacrifice things that are beloved to them. See, John was willing to lose his followers and his influence if it meant that people would follow Jesus. When you're convinced that Jesus is the savior of the world, you'll encourage others to experience him too. These two disciples, they acted on John's recommendation and they followed Jesus. They spent the rest of the day talking together. And we don't have a record of their conversation but it was so transformational for them that like John, they also left their experience convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Now here's what they did next. In John 1 verse 40, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, Andrew was so convinced that he immediately went to find his brother, to invite him to come and experience Jesus too. This, this is the power of the personal invitation at work. When we experience something great, we immediately want to tell others about it so they can experience it for themselves. See, when you love something, and it makes a difference in your life. You'll want to share it with the people you love. You see, when something changes you personally, you can't help but want others to have that same experience. Jesus might be great in general, but what does he mean to you in specific? See, it's one thing to believe that Jesus is the savior of the world corporately, but as you experience Jesus as the savior of your world, you'll invite others to experience him personally too. So what has Jesus saved you from? What were you like before you met him? How has following him changed you? Are you less selfish now? Are you less prideful? Are you less greedy? If not, you should ask yourself if you're taking time with him, hearing his voice, moving in obedience. See, the changes that come from obedience, they demonstrate how he's saving us. And when we can identify that salvation that we're experiencing, we want it for others too. Now watch what happens next. In John 1 verse 42, it tells us that Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. And looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Just like his brother, Simon now gets his own transformational moment with Jesus. And this transformation is an identity change, a transformation in how Simon understands himself. The Bible tells us that Simon is a commercial fisherman and he's working the family business for his father. His given name, Simon, means to hear or What has been heard? And if that's not a super inspiring name, it it helps to know that the meaning has to do with what is said about someone. Our modern term could be reputation. Simon was known as his father's son, similar to his father in trade, and most likely in temperament. You see, if his temperament and his reputation had been more like his brother Andrew, he would also have been involved in the process of higher education and spiritual discipline like Andrew was. But Peter doesn't see himself as someone who would follow a rabbi on a spiritual journey. See, Simon, he's much more known for who he's related to than who he is. Maybe this is something that you can identify with. Are you longing for an identity that transcends maybe a troubled past or ways of living handed down from generation to generation like a legacy, maybe it's substance abuse, divorce, 
deception, incarceration, addiction, it can feel like our family's trajectory is inescapable. But I want you to know that Jesus sees you clearly. The you he created to live free from the power of pain and disappointment. See, it all changes for Peter during this encounter with Jesus. It changes him because Jesus sees him differently than everyone else does. And it's important to note that the difference between how Jesus sees Simon and how even Simon sees himself is clarity. Jesus sees Simon clearly as the maker of all things. Jesus knows who Simon is, who he created Simon to be. So when he describes Simon, it is the purest definition of who Simon was designed to be. And it was a signal of the purpose that Simon was handcrafted to serve. Have you ever found something that looks very specific? Maybe it seems very intentionally designed, but you had no idea what it was. I'm always coming across things that look cool, but I have no idea about. So my friend Jordan told me about a place on the internet where you can upload a picture and get a crowdsourced answer. Reddit.com is a network of internet communities where people can dive into their interests, hobbies, and passions together. There's a subreddit for nearly everything. One of them is called, What is This Thing? A community of people draw upon their experiences and their research to identify things for people. For instance, somebody posted about these metal charms or hang tags that they found in a bag of buttons. They wanted to know just what they were. And within a few minutes, the fishermen in the group identified them as metal spinners designed to reflect light and attract fish to your lure. Another person posted about this piece of ornately crafted metal that just suddenly appeared in the sink from nowhere while they were washing the dishes. The online users helped the person identify it as a cufflink that must have fallen off during the washing. Now, not everything is this easy, right? Sometimes items just don't get clearly identified. The, the jury is still out on this contraption, right? It's an old box carved with religious figures on the top. And the lid is hinged and opens up to reveal a cavity inside. And people speculated that it might have been used to make sacramental wafers or maybe an incense crusher. Now, the best guess is that it's a grape press used to make juice because of the pour spout there to, to fill communion cups. But without more information, there's no definitive answer. What would help is to talk to the person who made it. If you want to know who or what something is, you should always ask the creator. Jesus, the person who made all of us, meets Simon, but he sees Peter. He offers him and all of us a better definition than the one that we invent for ourselves or the one that gets placed on us by crowdsourcing. Jesus tells Simon that his name will be Cephas, which is Aramaic, an old ancient language for Peter, which means rock solid. Jesus sees him as a solid foundation that he and others can depend upon. Jesus sees him as a future leader of his disciples, someone who will lead the first church after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, I think it's important for us to recognize that this is not who Peter currently is. He's currently not even a follower of Jesus, but it is who Peter will become in the future as he walks away from his own plan and surrenders to Jesus' plans for his life. As Peter walks away from his definition of himself and accepts Jesus' definition of him. This is so important for us to grasp because it's fundamental to our desire to invite others to meet Jesus and be transformed by his clarity and power as well. Jesus sees us and knows who we truly are. He knows who we will become if we follow him. And as we follow him, he offers the ability to transcend our failures and our fears with faith. Time with Jesus will reveal that you are fully known and fully loved, understood for where you are, and encouraged and enabled to be better than you ever imagined. Get to know Jesus, 
and you will get to know yourself like he does. He'll shape you as disciple. He will pour his spirit in you. You will get to know him and become the version of you that God wants you to be, the version that talks to Jesus every day to learn what is right and true and good. And then he will give you his power to do those things, destroying the selfishness that threatens to consume us. Now, this isn't where the story ends. It says this, right? The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. And Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. As Jesus invited more and more people to experience his discipleship, he met Philip. And it tells us that Philip ran to find his friend, Nathaniel. There's a lot here, but I just want us to look at one thing specifically. And it's found throughout these stories. Stories of people inviting their friend to experience Jesus' transformation with them. All of these stories feature an act of active searching for the friend to offer the invitation. Remember, this story was originally written in ancient Greek, and the Greek word in each case, Andrew finding Peter, Jesus finding Philip, Philip finding Nathaniel, they all use the verb eurisco. It means I find, I learn, I discover, but this part is important, especially after searching. There's intentionality here. Each person had a friend they were investing in a relationship with. And when they experienced something amazing, they intentionally identified that person and went to go find them to offer the invitation. They loved their friend and they wanted them to join them in the community of transformation. See, when you recognize that you've been sought out, you will begin to seek people out. Each of us was sought out by Jesus. We found him because he came looking for us. And this invitation to meet is almost always brokered by somebody we know. Let me ask this. Who is it that introduced you to a transformative experience with Jesus? Maybe it was a friend or a family member. They were sought out and they sought you out. Philip is so convinced that Jesus is the Savior and that it would be best for Nathaniel to join their group that he says, we have found Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, come join us. This is so important because people might think positively of Jesus and agree that he's good for the world, but I, I think we're often skeptical that things will work for us, especially if we've experienced disappointment. And I want you to know that Nathaniel has some skepticism. His response is to openly question Philip's claim. In John 1.46, Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come see for yourself, Philip replied. In those days, Nazareth was not sought after real estate. It wasn't considered wicked or wrong, but nobody had high expectations for it. Think of it like Vancouver or McMinnville. To Nathaniel's mind, if the savior of the world was here, shouldn't he be from Jerusalem, the holy city? Nathaniel was hesitant to accept the invitation. I think it's important that we notice that Philip doesn't feel the need to argue or convince or even rebuke Nathaniel, not even for his elitism. He simply responds by extending another invitation, the deeply personal, come see for yourself. I can't convince you, but Jesus can. Remember that Jesus doesn't need advertising. He'll come for you. And if you'll come check it out, you'll be changed. So today, I want to finish with this. We all know that the personal invitation is the best invitation, better than any social media ad, any banner, any direct mailer. If you can't think of someone right now that you could invite to come to your small group or a Sunday service, it means that it's time to take an interest in someone. Who are you taking an interest in? Who is it that you are on the lookout for? 
John, Andrew, Philip, they all had people that they'd begun relationships with. They'd taken interests in others, and this opened doors to new relationships. None of their invitations to follow Jesus were cold calls to random people on the street. It was to people they'd set out to be interested in. See, many of us believe that we'll make friends and develop relationships by being an interesting person. Cool hair, clothes, experiences, and all the cool social posts to prove it. But isn't it true that the people we love most are the ones who are interested in us? See, interesting people get a lot of looks, but they don't give or get a lot of love. Being interested is more important than being interesting. Ask God to point out someone, maybe even right now, ask him, God, show me someone to take an interest in so that you can show them love by investing in them. Who is it that you're investing in? Who are you giving your time, effort, and energy to? These will be, likely, will be people you already know, people who know you love them, people that you've already demonstrated that you care, maybe neighbors, friends, and family, people who an invitation would mean a lot to. See, they're the people most likely to know that you aren't inviting them to meet Jesus for your sake, but for theirs. Who is it that you've taken an interest in and invested in that is ready for an invitation? Don't miss this, right? A personal invitation is the difference between knowing that something is available to you and knowing that you are wanted, that people want you to join them. See, we can't just assume that people know they're welcome. We need to tell them that they are wanted. This fall, we have so many opportunities for you to invite someone to meet Jesus with you. We've got Sunday services They're designed as easy points of connection for every kind of person at all of our campuses. Why not invite someone to attend or watch with you? Then maybe get some lunch or coffee afterwards. We've got big activities for people who feel comfortable in a crowd, and we have small group settings for people who feel more comfortable in cozier connections. Inviting someone to join you in men's, women's, or youth community is an easy entry point. We even have the more structured but open to everyone experience of Rooted starting up in just a few weeks. The best invitations to Jesus are personal invitations to shared transformative experiences. And as we identify and invest our lives into others, we'll invite them into life-changing experiences with Jesus, with us. Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us that you come to find us. And God, I just pray for each person who has been found, who received an invitation. God, that you would spur us on. Help us to identify and invest and invite people, people that you love, that you see clearly so that they can come to understand who you created them to be. God, to set them free from an identity that maybe they've chosen or that someone else has placed on them that isn't the identity you have for them. God, help us to see and love people clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, thank you so much for joining us online. I want you to know that we've got websites for each of our three campuses, and you'll find the links below, that actually have links to the dates and the times of opportunities and activities for you to engage with your friends that you are identifying, investing in, and inviting. And whether that's a Sunday service, small groups, a rooted experience, maybe just a concert or a movie night, we'd love for you to check into it, find an opportunity, and reach out. We'd love to see you both here. Have a great week. We're praying for you.